Uh, good evening, all. Uh, I'm Ajiba, and uh, today's case presentation will be moderated by Dr. Shrinivasan, sir. A 19 year old female patient who is a resident of Bellu, student by occupation, came with the chief complaints of diminution of vision in right eye for one month. History of present illness. The diminution of vision in right eye was insidious in onset and gradually progressive in nature, associated with difficulty in seeing bright light and glare. There was no improvement with refractive correction. There was a history of on and off irritation. No history of pain or redness. There is no history of trauma. History of contact lens use in left eye for the past three months. And uh, she used it for six hours per day, monthly disposable, and the contact lens hygiene was well followed. She discontinued one month back as she was not very comfortable with it. There was no history of systemic illness or skin diseases. She is not on any medication. There was no history of recent COVID infection and not vaccinated yet. History of similar complaints alternating between two eyes since the age of three years. Her parents first noticed a white spot in left eye at the age of three years and consulted an ophthalmologist. Father gives history of corneal transplantation performed in left eye at the age of five years. Six months to one year later, she developed similar complaints in her right eye. History of corneal procedures done thrice in left eye and twice in right eye. Patient feels the vision remains stable for one to two years post-treatment. Past ocular history, superficial keratectomy was done twice in both eyes. Uh, the history of keratoplasty being done once in right eye and twice in left eye. Past medical history, there are, there's no history of any systemic illness. She's not on any medication and she's using currently only lubricants in both eyes. Personal history, normal bowel and bladder habits, there's no history of any allergy. Family history, the history of similar complaints in her twin sister. She has also undergone corneal procedures in both the eyes. There's no history of similar complaints in her parents or other family members. Coming to the general examination. Yeah, just wait. Yes. What is the history? So you have two siblings with corneal problems, bilateral. What is the point in history that Ajiba has missed? Any history of contactivity. Yes. So you know, if you if you are dealing with a dystrophy, you are asking. She asked the history for the parents. Yes. So that part was absolutely fine. The next step should be a history of consanguinity because you're trying to find out is there, what is the type of disease that you, so unless that word comes in, you will not go to the next uh, level in your uh, viva. So history of consanguinity is uh, important here. Second, what mistake did she make in her history? So that's something that she's probably an error in writing it up because initial history she said three transplants in the left eye, subsequent history she says two transplants in the left eye. So there cannot be a difference. It is either three or it is two. It cannot be. So when you are repeating it, you have to be absolutely clear what you are uh, repeating in terms of the thing. So once you've seen a patient with a bilateral corneal problem, uh, which has come somewhere around two years, three years of age, and it is recurring. What are the differential diagnoses that you would think of? So any uveitic uh, cause? Okay, uveitic cause can have because you could you could have a JRA kind of a thing, which finally with a BSK kind of a presentation. Yes, here the pain component was not there. It was more of photophobia as compared and decrease in vision. So you are primarily looking at a keratitis kind of a picture. So either a lid margin related issue, which could cause bilateral. So you can have bilateral pectinular keratitis repeatedly, which can cause photophobia, which can cause a decrease in vision. But the vision decrease will not be as much that you would want a corneal transplant uh, as such. You are looking at probably dystrophies or you are looking at certain conditions where there can be an increase in deposits in the cornea as time goes by, which could be like some mucopolysaccharidosis. Yeah, so some kind of, yeah. So, coming, okay, so now that you've said mucopolysaccharidosis, what are the types of, uh, how many types of mucopolysaccharidosis do you know? Hurler and Hurler Shice has corneal involvement. Hunter doesn't have corneal, corneal involvement. You have about six types of mucopolysaccharidosis. So, but my idea was to get mucopolysaccharidosis into the picture. The next would be based on the age of the patient, would be any dystrophy. Or it could be deposits. Deposits could be because of drugs it could be because of medications but again all those features will come in a slightly older patient it will not come in 
such a young patient. So when you're dealing with such a young patient, you're probably looking at corneal dystrophies right from the history that you are uh, getting getting to. Okay. The other thing would be something like corneal keloid. But a corneal keloid will have a history of surgery or some kind of a trauma which precedes the onset of corneal scarring or precedes the onset yes. of decrease in vision. Okay, go ahead with the general examination. Okay. Yes, sir. The patient is moderately built and nourished, conscious, oriented to time, place and person. There is no pallor, ictus, cyanosis, clubbing or lymphadenopathy. She was afebrile with a heart rate of 76 per minute, respiratory rate 18 per minute, blood pressure of 130 was 70 mm of mercury. The cardiovascular and the respiratory system were within normal limits. Coming to the ocular examination, head poster was normal, no facial asymmetry, extraocular movements were free and full, pupillary examination in right eye, the direct light reflex could not be assessed, consensual right reflex was present, and in the left eye, direct, consensual and the near reflex was present. Uh, visual acuity che checked using Snell and Start in the right eye was uncorrected visual acuity was counting fingers at 50 cm and for the near vision was less than N36. There was no further improvement with a pinhole or with a refractive correction. And in the left eye, the uncorrected visual acuity was 6 by 15 with N6, no further improvement with pinhole. And the best corrected was uh, with even with minus 1 and a minus 2 cylinder was still 6 by 15 and N6. Coming to the slit lamp examination of the right eye, the lid and adnexa are normal, conjunctiva and sclera are normal, the cornea in diffuse illumination, donor graft was present, the graft hole junction is secure, the donor corneal surface appears irregular and shows multiple blue drop like opacities coalescing at the center and involving the visual axis. There was a diffuse corneal haze. And in the slit, uh, slit beam, the corneal opacity was involving the epithelium, subepithelium, and the anterior stroma. The endothelium appears compact. The corneal sensation in the right eye was reduced. And this is the slit lamp, uh, diffuse illumination slit lamp picture of the right eye. And there was no further view of the anterior segment in the right eye. Yeah, one second, Ajiba. Thanks. So, I mean, I, I told you not to take the patient's uh, file and uh, but even if and this exactly is not the the photo which you had actually seen but even if you have an opacity in the center your peripheral cornea will still be reasonably clear so if you make a slit and you see you will be able to assess the anterior chamber details if you are not able to assess the anterior chamber details what is the investigation that you can use to assess Ajiba? Uh, ultrasound ultrasound what normal ultrasound no, B scan, sir. Anterior segment details, oh. you don't need a B scan. You need a anterior segment. Yeah. Ultrasound biomicroscopy. But you ha that is still a contact-based procedure. You have to place a Prager shell. You have to put this thing. Something which is non-contact based, which can give you the same details. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, anterior uh, segment uh, optical coherence tomography will also give you an idea. So if, if you are seeing an opacity like this, uh, Sneha, and you want to do an OCT. What is it that in the OCT you are looking at? Why do you want to get the OCT done? You have seen this. You know this is a dystrophy. You want to do an OCT. It's not just for academic reasons. There is a reason to do the OCT. What is the reason for doing the OCT in this patient? So to know the depth of involvement. If your anterior chamber is not seen well, you can use it. Get a better idea. But more importantly, you need to know the depth of involvement. Now with dystrophies, uh, why are you looking at the depth of involvement? To plan the management uh, for the anterior stomach dystrophy, uh, uh, like uh, laminar cataplasty or PT can also be done. Otherwise, full thinness is not there generally. Your resolution, yeah, your res uh, which dystrophy goes across all three, all the layers? Maximum. So, if you, have, if you say the difference of OCT is to decide on, on lamellar versus PK, I would say no. Because the OCD doesn't give us that resolution. And that part I'll come to later. If you're looking at anterior to posterior, which dystrophy involves all layer of the cornea? Macular dystrophy, sir. Yeah, so macular dystrophy involves all the layers of the cornea as compared to some of the other dystrophies. And the o and OCT can give us some guidelines whether we could go ahead with a, with a PK or a DALC. 
but the idea of ocd is more if you are able to get a superficial level of your of your opacities you might consider just doing a ptk if it is uh, slightly more deeper you might consider doing a femtosecond assisted lamellar procedure if it is significantly deep you might have to consider doing a talc but when you are dealing with diseases like ched or diseases like macular dystrophy the thickness of the desmet endothelial complex if it is significantly high indicates that the desmet endothelium is also not very healthy where you will need for a macular dystrophy you might have to consider doing a pk and for a ched you might have to if you are contemplating an endothelial transplant you would have to consider doing a desmet stripping endothelial keratoplasty whether you do desec or demec whereas if your desmet endothelium in a ched is much thinner it's not significantly thicker you might get away with a non stripping endothelial transplant also so if you are looking at ocd this uh, is the indication as far as a, a dystrophy uh, is concerned apart from uh, academically documenting the level of ocds with respect to the uh, to the uh, corneal status yeah go ahead is coming to the left eye stepland examination legit index or normal conjunctiva and sclera or normal uh in uh, cornea and diffuse elimination donor graft is present the graft host junction is secure with a deep corneal vascularization involving the periphery and with a interface haze there no sutures are present and the iris details are same and in the slit beam there is a uh, intact epithelium and endothelium with a compact stroma the vascularization was involving the posterior third of the stroma and the corneal sensation is intact and in the anterior chamber is optically clear with a van herix grading of grade 3 the iris is normal in color and pattern the pupil was round regular reacting to light the lens is clear and the anterior vitreous space was clear the regurgitation of pressure over the lacrimal sac area was negative in both eyes and finger tension was okay in both the eyes and the uh, intraocular pressure measured using goldman sublimation tonometer had distorted myers in the right eye and in the left eye it was 12 mm of mercury so if if in your one second so if in your exam you don't have you're not getting your uh, aplanation tension you have to specifically say that you would want to do a tonopen or you would want to do a uh, air puff uh, tonometer uh, well you might not uh, if nothing is possible only you will add finger tension but that you will keep that as the last as far as an exam uh, point of view is concerned because they will ask you okay uh, aplanation is not coming what is it that you would want to use to uh, to measure the uh, at go ahead coming to the fundus examination of was done with the indirect ophthalmoscope and with the 20 diopter lens there was no view in the right eye and in the left eye the media was clear The disc is normal in size, shape, color, with a healthy neuroretinal rim, and the cup disc ratio was 0.3. The vessels emanating from the disc are dichotomously branching with a arteriovenous ratio of 2 to 3. The peripheral retina and macula are normal with a normal foveal reflex. Case summary: The 19-year-old female patient with both eyes status post lamellar keratoplasty came with a progressive diminution of vision in right eye at present. with symptoms alternating between two eyes since the age of 3 years slit lamp shows donor car cornea with grayish white coalescing blue droplet opacities extending up to the anterior third of stroma involving the visual axis in right eye and donor cornea with deep deep stromal vascularization and clear lens in left eye with a normal fundus so my provisional diagnosis is right eye status post lamellar keratoplasty with the recurrence of gelatinous droplet corneal dystrophy and in the left eye status post lamellar keratoplasty with a clear lens okay so you have given a diagnosis of uh, probable gelatinous blue drop so if now that you know that it's a gelatinous blue drop any other test that you would have done clinically to help you confirm the diagnosis what is the what is the pathology where is the pathology in gdd at what level uh, epithelial subepithelial level sir. epithelial subepithelial level so what is the problem in the epithelium so the there is a amyloid deposition sir why does the amyloid deposition happen because of increased epithelial permeability to the tears and through tears you have deposition of the amyloid in the anterior cornea that's why your deposition is more anteriorly and that is why the recurrence rate of this dystrophy is very very high 
and that is why the treatment one of the treatment modalities to reduce recurrence is to use a contact lens that will reduce the permeability of the uh, deposits from the tears into the anterior stroma so if you do a fluorescein stain if you do a fluorescein stain in these eyes you will see an increased staining or increased uh, fluorescein permeability of the epithelium into the anterior cornea so that tells you that the epithelial permeability is not good okay yeah next so these are just pictures so uh, yeah you can just go through the pictures of the patient uh, at various uh, stages of collage for people to just uh, go through and then uh, yeah go through the next so now before we uh, go to the investigation part I mean, because we already finished the oct we've uh, um, done the uh, ubm part a little bit so you have a patient with uh, a young patient with uh, bilateral corneal opacity or a child with the bilateral corneal opacity what is your differential diagnosis sir congenital glaucoma okay what is the mnemonic congenital corneal opacity bilateral stop down what does s stand for sir sclerocornea hmm. then uh, trauma uh, traumatic and uh, okay um, ulcers ha huh? and uh, mucopolysaccharide so mentioned metabolic metabolic sorry ah, yeah okay m ha huh? and uh, peters peters e. yeah e e, e. Uh, endothelial corneal dermoid so you have, so if you are dealing with a pediatric patient this is something that will be asked they are not going to concentrate too much on uh, dystrophy per se they will come to only um, the deposits and uh, the um, uh, the transmission in terms of autosomal dominant or resistant but you and then you will go on to questions on pk uh, and outcomes of pk in general and rejections of graft in in, in terms of your case presentation uh, as such so you said uh, stump is one of the dd as far as your uh, uh, clinical uh, this thing is concerned okay uh, let me a corneal edema in a child so this is generally for opacity so if you are dealing with the corneal edema bilateral corneal edema in a child then what are you looking at so endothelial dystrophy or endothelial dystrophy what are the types of endothelial dystrophy that you are looking at CHD. Okay, one day. PPCD. Okay. So what, is, what is the difference between CHD and PPCD? For the high level, okay, this is for more for fellows, but I mean, in fact, what? Okay, let's go to basic. What is the types of CHD that is given in your textbooks? Sir, actually, CHD of two types, type one and two, but type one actually is considered as PPCD. Now considered as PPCD because it's been located to the same. genetic location of 20th uh, chromosome so it uh, chd in general now is considered only a type 2 which is an autosomal recessive form so mm-hmm. if you have a chd autosomal recessive what are the characteristics for a chd that you would see autosomal recessive patient early involvement can also present uh, with uh, sensory neural uh, hearing loss what and that is called what syndrome uh, arvoyan syndrome yes okay so and, you start off with loss your your visual loss is more so you will end up having nystagmus a type 2 chd or a notosomal recessive are not photophobic this generally doesn't progress it remains the same but their visual loss is more because of the severity of the corneal uh, edema that is uh, that is there for a ppcd generally it starts a little bit later or the type 1 it is autosomal dominant the haze might progress more but generally they don't have nystagmus as compared to a, an ideal type 2 chd uh, as such so if you have a corneal edema you are looking at chd you are looking at ppcd then you are looking at bufthalmia like uh, glaucoma glaucoma and you are looking at anterior segment dysgenesis along with secondary glaucoma so you have congenital glaucoma as a separate subset and you have anterior segment dysgenesis along with uh, secondary glaucoma which can also cause a corneal uh, 
edema. Apart from that, you're looking at forceps delivery, which can give rise to edema as such. Okay, so now you uh, you said okay, um, and the other uh, thing is uh, with um, accident field rigor or I mean accident field or even PPCD, you can have uh, or with Peters, you might have anterior sinica, which is not seen generally in a pure CHD. So if you're looking at a patient with corneal edema, when you do a OCT or when you're doing a UBM, you're looking at the anterior chamber. So you're looking at the iris, you're looking at the angle. You're looking at iridocorneal touch. You're looking at lenticulocorneal touch. You're looking at uh, any evidence of endothelial vesicles, which will suggest in 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 the eye, which is slightly more clearer, which will suggest a subtle PPCD as as the differential diagnosis. Uh, the OCT will show you a much thickened desmets and endothelium as far as CHD is concerned and PPCD is concerned. With respect, and even congenital glaucoma is concerned. With respect to Peters and anterior segment dysgenesis, you will have the OCT showing you more of the anterior chamber anomalies uh, with respect to peripheral anterior sinicae or the uh, lenticular corneal uh, additions that you see. So uh, you've done the uh, OCT, you've done ultrasound, you've done uh, the specular microscopy. Uh, in GDD patients, you will not get it. Obviously, if you're dealing with an endothelial dystrophy patient, uh, like in a Fuchs, you would want to do uh, a specular microscopy or, or you're dealing with a PPCD, you will want to do a specular microscopy. Uh, corneal biopsy generally is not required unless you are not sure of what you are dealing with, which is rare because once you get a picture which is so classical, you don't need a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. Biopsy is a part of your treatment. So, where you do an LK or an anterior uh, lamellar keratoplasty, you can send it for histopathological confirmation as far as your diagnosis is concerned. Uh, Ajibha, go to the next slide. So, uh, as far as uh, this particular case is concerned, the management, uh, uh, this is not something that you will normally see in your exam. So, I'm just going to be going through the management and then we start off with the other kind of stromal uh, dystrophies as such. So here, uh, the treatment option is superficial keratectomy initially, but the recurrence rates are higher. So we went, we did a couple of superficial keratectomies, then we did an anterior LK, then we did a DAL, and uh, finally, because there was a recurrence at the interface involving even the, the decimals, because the tear does go through the graft hose junction and go into the interface, we had deposits on the interface uh, and the decimals also, so we had to do a PK. For her sister, both the eyes, she's had about 3-3, DALS for her. One eye has had about three DALS. This is this eye has uh, the fourth transplant where we had to do a, a PK as such. Which is the dystrophy which has the maximum recurrence rate in transplants? Mancular. That is with respect to stromal dystrophies. So when I put a broad thing with dystrophies, then epithelial uh, and basement membrane dystrophies have a maximum recurrence rate. So in that context, it's going to be GDD followed by Reese Buckler. If you're looking at pure stromal dystrophies, macular dystrophy has the highest uh, recurrence uh, rate as such. So uh, now that we kind of finish, yeah, go to the next slide. Yeah, so now we, uh, yeah, that's okay. Talk about uh, the different types of stromal dystrophies. What is the mnemonic that you would want to remember to know the type of dystrophy, the deposit, and the stain use. I can literally read the I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, fine. So I think there's some issue with an audio. Yeah. So Marilyn Monroe gets her men in LA or Los Angeles City. So Marilyn is mucopolis um, macular mucopolysaccharidosis. So somebody will uh, will uh, mention about the entire thing. Sorry, I didn't get the question. The the uh, this thing was Marilyn Monroe gets her men in Los Angeles City is the mnemonic. Yes. Sir. For remembering the dystrophy with the uh, deposit okay. and the stain. So you want to give the uh, the entire version. M M. So Marilyn stands for macular. M stands for mucopolysaccharidosis. Okay. Yes, okay. So M M gets granular high line. And lattice star. Is that Marilyn? So Ma Marilyn Monroe gets her man in Los Angeles City is something which is very easy for you to remember. It is sexist, but it is easy for you to remember in terms of mnemonic. So forget about the uh, the other part, but you can actually remember the deposits with respect to what is your dystrophy, what is the deposit and what is the stain that is used because that is something which you will be asked 
both in your theory and in your uh, practicals. Uh, Ajiba, you can present the slide and uh, you can mention it, and then Dr. JB will give can give his inputs on the on the pathology of the dystrophy. Okay. Uh, this is a histopathology slide of the normal cornea. Uh, we can see the epithelium and the layers of stroma and the endothelium. Now we look at the various dystrophy with the deposits. This is the lattice dystrophy and the right side picture is the uh, hematoxylin eosin stain of uh, the amyloid deposition. And the special stain used in lattice dystrophy is the Congo red stain which uh, gives a bright red color and with the uh, uh, polarized light it gives the apple green biofringence, the right side picture. On the granular dystrophy, the material deposited is the hyaline, uh, hyaline in the corneal stroma with stains bright red with the massin trichome. And uh, this is the macular dystrophy where we can see the deposition of mucopolysaccharide which is shown in the blue color with, uh, with stains with the alcyon blue and the colloidal ion. So if you, yeah. so if you want to remember it simply uh, at least to an extent that uh, granular it's a lot more you see a lot more red in the stroma with macular it's a lot more blue and hopefully if you get a spotter of lattice you will get a birefringence um, image it becomes easier for you to identify it as such but again because you might have spotters based on the covid situation it is important for you to see and remember the uh, images and understand the pathology in terms of the layers where you are what you are dealing with obviously if you have a patient with uh, a cornea with infection you will see a lot more of cellular reaction which you are not seeing here so that is a clue that it is probably a dystrophy one you need to identify it as cornea second you need to identify it is a dystrophy or it is an infection because these are the common things from a cornea that you would be uh, asked to comment uh, sir you can uh, just one second eh? i just in the congo red stain amyloid is seen rose red color and then birefringence is seen when the polarized light is there, put into that birefringence. And there's another term called dichroism. You rotate the polarizer, that what is yellow, that change into green, green becomes yellow. Very nice class. I'm learning cornea again. <laughs> Thank you. Sir. So it's important to know the pathology part as far as your uh, exams are concerned because uh, you understand the disease also better if you are able to correlate it with what is happening at a microbiological level. And I, I miss the cube dystrophy which shows the thickened decimates membrane with the wart formation and the endothelium appears degenerated with the epithelium subepithelial bullae formation and the stromal edema. Sure. I'd like to thank Kobias and Sir and Nikhil for guiding me with the presentation and JB Sir for providing me with such beautiful histopathology pictures. Thank you, Sir. Thanks, Sir. Uh, I think uh, now we go to Nikhil. Nikhil, the last questions along with your presentation now. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as these are the broad headings under which the answers of corneal dystrophies, uh, specifically when DND questions are seen, corneal stromal dystrophies are the commonly asked. Uh, question sets in which these are the headings in which uh, sir has already discussed uh, right from definition to classification the older and the newer the mode of inheritance symptoms signs different varieties which uh, dr jb sir gave the slides of the different stains and the investigation modality and treatment according to these investigation and based upon that so definition and mode of inheritance we have already discussed coined in 1890 and mostly it is autosomal dominant, bilateral, symmetrical, hereditary, non-inflammatory and slowly progressive. And some are definitely unilateral, but very rarely. So difference between degeneration and dystrophy we have discussed. Classification of dystrophy. Previously, there used to be only anatomical classification. After meetings in 2003, 5, later the 2015 ICD-3 classification, which is there. It is very easy classification to remember basically category 1, 2, 3 and 4. So category 1 are those dystrophies in which mutated genes with their chromosomal loci, everything has been identified. So well established dystrophies are category 1. And category few, 4 are the new dystrophies which are never mentioned in the history, not ever <coughs> located in any chromosomal loci or no gene has been identified. So basically any dystrophy which after detailed investigation or after uh, detailed research can change its category. Basically whichever new uh, gene is there. So 
if few locus are identified it can go in category 2 and then it can become category 1 also so ultimate study and research is going to transform every category 4 and 3 into 1 so these are four categories and almost all known basically all three main stromal dystrophies which we study and the stains we have discussed are category 1 This was the old classification in which epithelial subepithelial are the dystrophy gelatinous dew drop dystrophy the case we discussed along with that there are EBMD epithelial basement membrane we'll see them accordingly with the pictures as spotters are going to be new exam questions for all of you all so it will be easy to see their pictures and understand the dystrophies uh, according to their uh, signs and epithelial stromal dystrophy stromal dystrophies and the endothelial dystrophy so this classification has been circulated with you all in the handouts also so just go through that before summary summarizing this answer split lamp examination some important point uh, as sir already mentioned i would like to uh, mention them again examine both the eyes as both of maximum of them are bilateral uh, dilated retroillumination is the most common uh, way to examine though other illuminations are also very important but this is where the dystrophies are picked up really better dilated retroillumination topographic determination for the layer affected different investigation we have seen which layer is there we should be seeing that and according to the characteristic opacity pattern where this is cyst like line like or refractile pattern or there is some tissue loss has been seen or cystic pattern are there or not we have to see that So first coming to epithelial corneal dystrophy uh, they are very predisposed to recurrent erosion rather this is the main symptom these patients are presenting with if symptomatic and getting early in the morning uh, early in the morning they have uh, symptoms more pronounced due to hypoxia okay clear cyst like opacities i would like to ask any one of you if clear cyst like opacities what could be the dds for the same If we see the cyst-like opacities in the cornea, what could be DD uh, DDs for the same? If anyone can answer. Meesman corneal dystrophy. Okay. Okay, that is one dystrophy. Any other dystrophy? And apart from dystrophy, also. EBMD. EBMD can be one. Okay, so EBMD, Meesman, Lish, uh, the blebs and the dots. These typical which are seen are. Kogan cyst or Kogan dots and brown blebs, which are seen in the retroillumination. So this is the EBMD complete picture. First, we have already seen the cyst-like opacities, and there are these fingerprint-like lines. So map dot fingerprint-like lines having Kogan dots and brown blebs. So line-like opacities are there, which can also be seen in lattice, but which are different types. We'll be seeing that. So if we see these line-like opacities, fingerprint-like lines. What can be DDs of that non-dystrophy DDs of these lines? What could be them? Vokstrai. Vokstrai, okay, but it would be deeper and it would be located in one location according to the keratoconus cone and where the thinning is the most. Stress. What? Chicken nerve. Myel myelinated nerve fibers. Myelinated nerve fibers is absolutely line. There are various DDs of myelinated nerve fibers as meant to be leprosy neurofibromat. Yes, so myelinated nerve fibers actually do look like this. So hypertrophied nerves or myelinated nerve fibers, hapstry, and the DMT or scars after hydrox, but those will be deep and vokstry. So these are few pictures for as we can uh, see here, the dots and the lines or the map pattern also. So map dot fingerprint like appearance in all these three pictures we can actually make out, and as we can see the best picture. Apart from the diffuse, diffuse or any illumination is dilated fundus with retroillumination. Yeah, one second, Nikhil. Yeah. Yes. So what you are seeing here, these whitish dots are basically the uh, Kogan dots, and what you yes. was what you saw in the first picture was the brown was 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 more of a bleb like uh, uh, thing, which is uh, yeah the yeah. so the bleb bleb pattern is a brown. Bleb. So I mean, it's not that you need to uh, really remember it because it's not going to change. Uh, um our management pattern as such but these have been mentioned so it's something that you need to at least know so when you are talking of ebmd you have map you mean if you look at maps dots uh, fingerprint lines so all these are basically because of abnormal deposition of material at the basement uh, membrane level and they can form various patterns if they are elongated in a particular line you get it as fingerprint lines if they are 
if they are just coalesce at a, at one particular area you will see it as uh, dots uh, as such and because they are there between the basal epithelium and the uh, and the basal, and the bowman's layer you end up having a loose epithelium there and uh, a loose epithelium or a slightly elevated epithelium will be picked up very easily with a fluorescein stain and it will be seen as a negative stained area so the area where the fluorescein clears off first if you keep looking at it closely some of the subtle findings which you don't see initially in slit lamp once you put a fluorescein strip and then you see the uh, negative stained areas and then you go back and see them more closely you'll be able to see subtle evidence of ebmd thank you sir yeah go ahead so this is the lattice dystrophy and indirect retroillumination we can actually see here the lattice like refractile uh, lines which are uh, characteristic of lattice dystrophy which is uh, limited to the anterior stroma and does not usually reach to the decimate in the endothelium so it's not the pan layer it is uh, restricted to the stroma anterior stroma so as we already saw these Kogan spots, uh, Kogan dots, sir, as already told, which is seen classically in EB, AMBD uh, or epithelial basement membrane, sorry, EBMD. It can similarly seen in the granular dystrophy, which we'll be seeing uh, later. So these are nodular type of uh, dystrophies in which gelatinous dewdrop, granular and Kogan dots can be confused. Any degeneration you know of that looks nodular like or which can confuse with this picture? Spiroidal degeneration. Uh, spiroidal will have more like a spirule like a pattern so any nodular degeneration you know of which looks like these nodules or which can be confused with these dystrophies so it's a salzman nodular degeneration yeah, which can be confused with specifically with the gelatinous mulberry pattern of dewdrop That's dystrophy correct. it can be very similar to that so this is uh, we have already discussed that case particular gelatinous dewdrop dystrophy this is the mulberry pattern sir described all the three patterns this is the first type according to clinical features uh, which is this condition if anyone can name this condition this is bilateral but asymmetric and the same image is uh, yeah there are two different uh, images but what does it indicate this also has dots it's like refractile it is bilateral this is more peripheral spiroidal degeneration spiroidal degeneration right so um, as sir indicated all the points though the classes of dystrophy something which can confuse in the pictures the peripheral more spirule likes we can see the structures so so yeah if you look at this the the, for the picture on the left uh, you you it's the classical spheroidal where you're seeing a yellowish appearance or an oil droplet kind of an appearance uh, it is called by various uh, names um, so you can you can just go through your textbook to know at least two or three names whereas this one is much more subtle and unless you actually zoom up your uh, slit lamp and evaluate it, you might actually mistake them for uh, uh, an EBMD uh, as such. These are two unique opacities which are um, previous anatomical classification according to that the Bowman layer dystrophies. One has a geographic pattern which is Rees Buckler and second is a honeycomb pattern which is classically seen uh, in the Thiel Behnke disease. Now coming to some crystalline opacities which are uh, specifically having multiple DDs, uh, we will be going through those pictures also. We can see crystalline uh, stromal dystrophy here, Schneider crystalline dystrophy. Since now Schneider is only being named currently with the new classification as Schneider corneal dystrophy only because crystalline, crystalline particles are seen only in less than 50% of the cases. It has DD like cystinosis, monoclonal gammopathy, stromal rejection and interstitial keratitis sequelae. Here are two pictures. Interstitial keratitis classically seen. Uh, the And second is here in the case of corneal transplant, uh, DALC patient, uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. The stromal rejection is nicely seen like crystal. So it can be confused with Schneider dystrophy or other crystalline stromal dystrophies. Just to understand the differentials of this dystrophy, this just, dystrophy. just to basically, I mean, you can have an interstitial uh, candy floss kind of an appearance in both the eyes, but obviously they will generally not be as symmetrical in both the eyes as compared to a normal uh, dystrophy, which is generally much more symmetrical. Uh, a stromal rejection also tends to have this. Uh, uh, this was actually a PK patient, not a LK patient, who who had uh, stromal and endothelial dystrophy, and it resolved with. Uh, 
presence of crystalline uh, deposits these are supposed to be antigen antibody deposits that is what gives rise to these uh, uh, crystalline deposits along with lipid in the uh, in the stroma so this is again something that you need to be aware of when you are looking at uh, uh, crystalline changes uh, in the cornea apart from say a betis uh, corneal dystrophy sometimes even some of the medications and drugs uh, uh, can cause deposits uh, uh, in the cornea so you can have adenochromone deposits you can have gold deposits you can have uh, silver deposits in the cornea and in the surrounding uh, conjunctiva uh, which you will need to pick up cystinosis can have cystine deposits uh, mm -hmm. in the cornea which will appear as uh, dots in the cornea and that could also be bilateral so you might confuse it with some kind of a stromal uh, dystrophy so you need to be aware of it. thank you so anti band like opacities we have already seen gelatinous dewdrop of one of the types the mulberry type we had seen the bsk can also present like that there are few other opacities overall which can have a presentation like band shaped keratopathy uh it is the ppcd with bsk one of the pictures just to show that bsk can also be the presentation of one of the dystrophy it can also be seen in other endothelial uh, endothelial dystrophies also like ched and x linked endothelial uh, corneal dystrophy some superficial diffuse opacities uh just to remember the names or to catch the picture as a spotter when diffuse central disc like schneider we have already seen there is a uh, francis kitty a uh, central disc patch like and if periphery is involved like this it can be a uh, lysine um cystine acetyl transferase uh, and fish eye disease can be classical of these ex, um, ex, uh, examples diffuse haze of mucopolysaccharidosis can also present like diffuse opacity as we had discussed before and fuchs epithelial edema but it would be central it won't be peripheral so superficial diffuse opacities also could be there central or peripheral congenital diffuse corneal haze we have discussed this in detail uh, as a stumped mnemonic this is how type 2 granular dystrophy looks when there is no uh, clear spaces in between and which we have both the components like a granular component and the lattice component also and this is how this is uh, called as a special avellino dystrophy yeah one second so, so basically apart from the bread crumb appearance you will have a uh, slightly linear strands of deposits so a classical type 1 granular has isolated bread crumbs we will come to that picture uh, later on whenever you have a starry type star kind of a pattern or you have linear lines then it is uh, a combination of uh, granular with uh, amyloid which is which is an avellino or a granular type 2 dystrophy yeah uh this is again a type 2 uh, granular dystrophy this picture has been taken how one dystrophy can be seen in different illumination patterns this is the retro illumination what we are seeing here is in the diffuse illumination we can see the interconnecting uh, granular dystrophy thing and this is the sclerotic scatter in which light has been put on the uh, limbus on this sclera in which the uh, total internal reflection shows a clear opacity which are present in the cornea so this is a a a a, a classical type 1 where you see more of bread crumb like uh, appearances intervening space is clear even though there is one area where there seems to be a a a, a line kind of a thing but it's still separate it's just a there was a little bit of movement when the photo was taken this is the macular dystrophy uh, which is um, present in all the layers as we can see and uh, just to take those pictures how is it uh, present till the limbus we can see the macular opacity signs are there and even till the endothelium as we can see diffuse gut data here in macular dystrophy so these pictures have been taken just to highlight the fact that macular dystrophy is one which does not have clear spaces in between according to this diagrams also we can see the pictures uh, when there is diffuse haze uh, it does not only it uh, not only involves the center but it also goes till the periphery and also till the depth to the, the last layer of cornea here also we can see in the left side where we can see it till the limbus uh, and when after ptk in the superficial macular dystrophy if it is only confined to the superficial layer of cornea uh, then the ptk can also gives us the clear central and visual axis can be clear so that patient can the same patient after ptk when we can see the 
विजुअल एक्सेस इज रीजनेबली क्लियर फॉर इम्प्रूविंग द विजन अगेन वन मोर पीके के पेशेंट ऑफ द मैक्यूलर डिस्ट्रोफी एंड इफ इट इज फुल थिकनेस देन डेफिनेटली द पीके रिमेन्स द ऑप्शन सो दिस दीज वेरियस पिक्चर्स ऑफ मैक्यूलर डिस्ट्रोफी सज टोल टू पुट टू शो द एक्सटेंट ऑफ मैक्यूलर डिस्ट्रोफी टिल द पेरीफेरी टिल द डेप्थ एंड अकॉर्डिंग टू दैट अकॉर्डिंग टू इन्वेस्टिगेशन according to depth of involvement the different treatment or the surgical management which is done yeah one second one second go back yes, so macular dystrophy you are having a corneal haze you are having the epithelium also involved you are having the uh, there's no intervening clear space you will see the involvement almost till the limbus you will see deeper endothelial kind of uh, or deeper stromal uh, scars also endothelium will show gutted changes your overall pachymetric value is thinner so mac macular dystrophy is you are dealing with a thinner cornea you can do a dalk also in a macular dystrophy but generally the visual outcomes are a little bit suboptimal um so if you are looking at better quality of vision it will probably be pk but on a case to case basis the decision between a dalk and a pk can always be done because this um, again like is a macular dystrophy the recurrence rates are a little bit on the higher side so you would want to be uh, repeating a dalk is easier repeating a pk reduces the uh in i mean sorry, sorry increases the risk of rejection significantly yeah uh, so just how we discussed uh, something about epithelial uh, and something about stromal also yeah. specific endothelial alteration points when you have classical railroad tracks appearance it is ppcd posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy multiple band like blisters like lesions grayish tissue at the dm level where endothelial is deficient and posterior circular comma like boomerang like predesmate opacity if we have that is called as of uh, ferinita and gutteta are present classically in the fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy which are excrescences and it gives classical beaten metal appearance with fine pigmentation moon crater like changes which are seen in classically ched 1 which is autosomal dominant and ppcd also can give moon crater like changes so this is a fuchs dystrophy classically beaten metal appearance which can be seen and uh, this is the pallidopite which has been done and uh, in which we can see in the posterior most layer of cornea which is the endothelium the excrescences uh, which are coalesced here and can be seen as gutteta uh this picture is to just summarize and again uh, to mention about the same point where the dystrophy is located that particular layer of cornea can be transplanted here the dmac is done in this patient with the uh, uh fuchs endothelial dystrophy and the clear cornea can be obtained later so the picture of dmac the disc is very thin which is very difficult to see here uh in which pi can be seen the intra op and the clear cornea which can be obtained later so in the in a spotter where you're just seeing a small pi and somebody is asking you what is uh, the surgery that is being done then uh, with the dsec you will still be able to make out with the dmac unless you really focus you might not be able to appreciate the disc so that will again be one spotter if at all they keep uh, something like that uh this is another variation of the fuchs when fuchs with uveitis is there so uh and another diagram here in which dmac gets successfully done in the fuchs patient along with glaucoma coexistent glaucoma so this is another picture uh, fuchs can present with various uh, of these types also when uveitis and glaucoma components are also associated so i would like uh, you all to answer one by one for one picture each it's just a spotter whatever we have discussed whatever pictures we have seen is just a revision of those pictures only uh, if anyone can mention which is this dystrophy one by one if you could just answer tail pink yeah it is honeycomb ajiba uh, like it's a honeycomb like appearance we, which we can see so it's a bowman layer thiel benke dystrophy if anyone can answer this like fuchs so endothelial involvement okay so it is endothelial involvement which is seen but it is above endothelium little bit also it is very difficult to even identify there it's a predesmate dystrophy so you can you can see the slit is showing a uh, fuchs will not show this kind of a whitish deposits on the surface fuchs if you are going to if somebody is going to show you fuchs is going to show you either the gutteta or is going to show you a broad beam where he, where you get a beaten metal appearance here in the slit you are seeing some kind of coma shaped opacities at the deeper level just above the desmet so this is a predesmet dystrophy 
Sir, is there any specific name for predesmith dystrophy or it's just called predesmith? Uh, uh, unless we actually do a genetic uh, testing, it's very difficult to know whether it is uh, cornea perineta or it, is, it just comes under predesmith dystrophy. So that's the only other, the cornea perineta, they say it's, it's like a flower dusting kind of a picture. But we, unless we do a genetic analysis, it becomes very difficult to identify and do it for sure. Granular type 1 with clear intervening space, the same pictures we have seen. No, sir, the granular plus lattice, what is that? Yeah, that is already discussed, okay. Yeah. I will go, yes. Yeah, anyone with this? Macular dystrophy. Macular dystrophy. Uh, the and the uh, hazy spaces in between C. Anyone with this? Which is this dystrophy? Lattice. EBM. Lattice. Yeah. So EBMD will not have so many interconnecting lines as such. You will see lines, you will see maps, you will see patterns, you will see dots. You see all that here also, but it looks much more, uh, these lines are much more prominent. So, and again, if you make a slit, you'll be able to see the, in a, in a retro elimination, the, the, the problem is you do not know the level at which you are seeing it, whether it's in the epithelium, whether it's in the stroma. So this is uh, a lattice dystrophy. So then the inferior part which looks dot like uh... lattice can also have dots you can have dots you can have lines which can be this dystrophy considering the discussions we had in the actually it's not so easily seen this one even though i tried to enhance the image so this you can see some refractile uh, lines here and they are there in the stroma so this is also actually lattice dystrophy go ahead next yeah. Should I disease we just discussed the peripheral yeah. corneal diffusion so it almost looks like a uh, a dense arcus all around, which over a period of time can move almost to the center. Yes, sir. Which is this we saw the description of regarding the scene? Both the images, the right side and the left side. What is the right side and what is the left side? Left looks like PPTD. Uh, okay, and the right? Lattice, probably. Lattice, in the rest of all the cornea is clear. There is only this one area. Both are PPCD. You have a tram track like sign, uh, you can see these lines, bicycles forming uh, uh, almost like a railroad kind of a thing here. And this is what is called as a moon crater uh, kind of a description as far as the region. So they are endothelial changes. What is the pathology in uh, PPCD is the uh, endothelium assumes some amount of characteristics of the epithelium. So it tends to multiply, it has microvilli projections and that is why uh, compared to uh, pure CHED, uh, your uh, progression of corneal edema and haze is more in a PPCD. PPCD can also end up having a peripheral uh, anterior sinicae. So if you have a patient with a corneal edema and a peripheral anterior sinicae and if it is uh, primarily unilateral, you are looking at PPCD. If you carefully look at the other eye and see any subtle evidence of PPCD, it becomes a PPCD. If the other eye is absolutely normal and he's a slightly older patient, then you're looking at ICE syndrome as one of the differential uh, diagnoses. If both the eyes have some kind of iridocorneal additions, then you're looking at axon field rigor as one of the differential diagnoses for corneal edema along with an irregular uh, anterior chamber, which is progressive. Yeah, anyone can tell which this dystrophy is or what this picture suggests. Does the cornea seem a little bit bulged up? Keratoconus. Which, which dystrophy is associated with keratoconus? Mm -hmm. so, you, so you do have an association of fuchs with keratoconus. So now if you have a patient of fuchs and keratoconus, uh, how do you manage the patient? Whether you want to do a DAL, whether you want to do a PK, or you want to do a DSEC or DMEC, how do you decide that? So if you have significant ectasia in terms of your corneal curvature is significantly altered, and the endothelial counts are, you are not able to image them or there is significant gut data, you might actually go ahead and do a PK. But if your peripheral um, cells are, counts are good and peripheral gut data is very minimal and it's only central gut data, you might consider doing uh, a DAL to improve the uh, curvature and hope that your peripheral cells will grow over or you can do a DSO subsequently if at all the patient is... Uh, uncomfortable with uh, with vision as such. But if you have a, if the patient was comfortable with glasses, see the timing of, of uh, corneal transplant for a Fuchs patient is generally around 50, 55, 60. It is very rare that you will do a transplant at 35 or 40 years of age. 
So if the patient has survived till 45, 50 years of age using glasses, then you know the curvature, even though you are getting a keratoconus, the curvature is not so bad that the patient is unhappy. You might give the patient the vision that he had with glasses before, so you might just consider a DSEC or a DMEC. Whereas if you are dealing with the patient at around 30, then you know it's probably the ectasia which is causing him the problem. Now, if the counts are very low, you it's better that you combine a PK. But if your counts are good, you might consider doing a DAC and at some point of time, if the endothelium fails, you would have to consider a DSEC or a DMEC at that point of time. This is the last for the quiz, which is this condition. Schneider corneal dystrophy. No, Schneider will be central no, 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 crystalline. crystalline. Okay, you can be in the 50% where there's no crystals, but uh, this is uh, from childhood. It's more of a diffuse haze in the cornea from the center to the periphery. Uh, there's a bit of nystagmus in this uh, child. What could it be? Concentrated hereditary and See, uh, photos, we just completed Schneider's more. Uh, in fact, the Schneider's image was from the book. That was the only image that uh, I didn't have. So, Schneider's is not something that we would see. So, from your exam point of view and from your clinical point of view, identified dystrophies that you would see normally. You would see a granular, you would see a ma macular, you would see a lattice, you would see a ched, you would see a fuchs, you would see a PPCB. If you look for it, you would see EDMD if you search for it. Reese Buckler, Thail Benke, all those are just to kind of complete the thing that you have at least seen that image once apart from your uh, uh, reading it in your uh, books. So, any yes. other questions? I think so, uh, the yeah. questions are over. Just two last important points. Herbion syndrome we have already discussed. So, this was one of the child with Herbion syndrome and DMEC was done in the same. Uh, this is negative staining also, sir, has already discussed. This is a Fuchs endothelial dystrophy with epithelial edema. And that can give negative staining because the fluorescein washout. Sir had explained this concept also. And this is the third point which Sir was saying. The PPCD variant when actually crater-like or uh, road track like uh, railroad track appearance is not there. But just the peripheral sinicate. No, this, yeah. so this patient presented diagnosed as ICE syndrome because the other eye was supposedly normal. But when you looked closely, there is this kind of a... Uh, railroad sign which indicates a PPCD. So one eye is PPCD, so the other eye becomes a PPCD variant where you have a peripheral iris uh, adhesion. So otherwise, if this eye was normal, this would have been ice syndrome because this is a 30 year old lady who comes. So then your your thought process is unilateral glaucoma, unilateral uh, corneal edema with peripheral anterior sinicate. You are thinking of uh, ice syndrome. But look at the other eye to be sure that there is no PPCD changes before you label it as ice. Yes. Sir. Because clinically this side, the, the, the uh, diffuse elimination looked normal. It was only in the slit that you are able to appreciate the subtle PPCD changes in the other. Yes. Sir. So I think uh, any questions? I've got a comment. Yes, sir. So we used to enjoy corneal pathology very much. Yes, Nowadays sir. you people started doing that DMEC, DSEC and all. We get only epithelium <laughs> and the uh, desmets membrane. It's um, it's not that enjoyable anymore. So I used to get the whole cornea. You know that we used to tell that which layer is involved. Reporting is sir, nowadays actually, the yeah. advancement is one way good, but one way for us is. Sir, actually we were we, we in fact I was speaking to Dr. KK also. We wanted to um, have a look if you could look at these uh, uh, fukes and uh, the other desmets that we give with uh, the live microscope that is there in pathology department to see if we can get some more information on the on the pathology, especially to differentiate between the PPCD versus, uh, versus uh, CHED kind of a thing. So maybe next time I do a procedure, we'll probably send it across to you and I'll just uh, call you up also. So we can try to see if we get some more information which helps us clinically. Sure, ma, we'll be more than happy. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Sorry. Goodbye. Thanks. Thanks. Good night, Goodbye. sir.